Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. I am uh, Stephen Penn. I'm the managing partner at KPMG, and I am so pleased that KPMG has the opportunity to, uh, to support incredible programming like this. At KPMG, we know the, the value that, and the importance of women in leadership positions and women on boards. And we know that this means a diverse perspective, a broad uh, talent level, and a better bottom line. Today, there are many uh, more women in leadership positions than, than ever before. Just recently, Fortune Magazine reported the number of women running businesses on the Fortune 500 hit an all-time record, 41. And for the first time, two Black women are running two Fortune 500 businesses. And while this is encouraging and while it demonstrates the progress of diversity and women in leadership positions, women still hold just 8% of the CEO spots at Fortune 500 companies. And of the largest 3,000 publicly traded companies, only one in five uh, board members are women. We hope today's event helps change those numbers as we hear from a group of fantastic panelists. And you'll meet them in a moment, but first it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator. She has made her mark on Kansas City and we are proud that she is part of our KPMG family where she served the uh, governmental, manufacturing, banking and nonprofit industries. She went on to build an amazing and very successful career at Black & Veatch where she just recently retired as the executive director, chief financial officer, and president of the Global Finance and Technology Solutions Division. She's also no stranger to boards. She was the chair of the KC Chamber Board in 2017 and held board positions with the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation, with the Women's Employee Network, and many others. She's also a past president of the Kansas City Missouri Parks Board, led the $80 million restoration of Liberty Memorial and was just honored uh, to receive the 2020 Athena Leadership Award. And by the way, she's also one of the owners of the Kansas City Royals. It's a real honor to welcome Karen Daniel. Karen. Thanks, Steve. I really appreciate the introduction and I am honored and delighted to be here today to talk about a subject that is near and dear to me. I wanna thank uh, Pete Marwick, KPMG, I should say, and I am a very proud alum, and Bank Midwest and the Chamber for putting on this panel today. Uh, this topic is really important, um, I think at this time for a number of reasons. One, when I think about what's going on in Kansas City and all the hard work that is being put in place so that our city is a community that works for all, it really requires requires a lot of diverse thinking and a lot of diverse voices. And we're gonna talk a, a lot today about women, but I think diversity is really important in a lot of the board discussions, whether it's not-for-profit or civic board or the corporate boards that Steve just mentioned. Uh, these are important times. And to me, the reason diversity and diverse voices matter really has to do with the fact that when you bring that many voices together, everybody is represented and that diversity in thought really becomes refined thinking. It's difficult, I believe, to plan for a company, an organization or community without it being properly represented. So that's one thing that I think is really important. And then I believe as we serve on boards, we have the opportunity to advocate, not just for the issues that those organizations face, but that we continue to have diversity among all that we impact. So that voice at the table is really important. We'll talk a little bit later about how to do that in a more uh, forward way. The third piece is talent development. And I say talent development because as all of us progress through our careers and our personal interest, we have to have the opportunity for development. And I will tell you that my first board assignment came from the efforts at KPMG to tell managers, you need to be out in the community. But what it also did was allow us to serve, of course, in the community, but it also gave us an opportunity to learn board governance and other things that are relevant. Plus, you get to see other boards work and other companies and learn skills from that. So those things really make the experience important. 
uh, the last bit, kind of bringing it all together, if you will, I believe in diversity and inclusion because we are simply better together. That's why it's so important. When I think about my own personal career, I just mentioned my first board assignment. You know, you can serve on not-for-profit boards, which tend to give back to the community, give you an opportunity to serve, or you can be on what we might call community or civic boards, which would, an example would be my time working on the chamber board. And those two aspects of my community service or service in general, I am extremely proud that I had an opportunity to work, for example, on the Women's Employment Network Board. You know, giving back to our community is one of our personal and professional responsibilities. So the not-for-profit boards are really important to getting things done. From the community perspective and the civic perspective, and when I think about the chamber, uh, the Kansas City, Missouri Parks Board, some of the other boards like that that are working across the community to bring forward uh, activities or legislation, those kinds of activities, I've really enjoyed that time as well. Uh, Steve mentioned the Liberty Memorial when I was on the park board. It was a great experience. It taught me a lot about the government. It taught me a lot about what's possible when you put your mind to it. And it was clear to me that while I was on the park board, I've said this before, I worked for Kay Barnes, who was our mayor, in terms of she appointed me, but the real work as she guided us was to really work for the community. And that's what we, we do at those kinds of boards. And then lastly, the corporate boards, which Steve talked about a little bit, I've had my opportunity to work on a number of corporate boards over the years. And part of that is also about talent development because Black and Beach really insisted on me serving on a publicly traded board so I could get additional expertise, knowledge, and to bring back to Black and Beach, but also just for my own personal development. And that's what I meant by talent development. So it's really important, I think, for us professionally to get an external perspective. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say about this topic is in the publicly traded world and even some of the private boards, there is increasing focus on environmental, social, and governance. And the boards are really looking to diversify their boards for those three areas. You know, the environmental being more about how we impact climate change and things of that sort. But the social issues are becoming much, much more of a responsibility for all of us. And corporations have sometimes stayed away from that or sometimes gotten involved in it. But there is increasing interest and pressure on addressing social issues. So those are the, the reasons that I think this is important. And of course, there's a lot going on in our nation right now. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then the last thing that I wanna say is it's really up to us individually to design our future. And what I hope people take away from this conversation today is that you have the opportunity to serve on all of these boards, all the types of boards that we've talked about and you have to be intentional about designing your future and how you want to participate, whether it's getting back to the community, serving in a civic role or being on a corporate board. So we have saved time at the end of our discussion to go through the questions that you guys have. And so we look forward to that. Now I'd like to introduce a really impressive uh, group of women who are going to participate in our discussion today. I'll start with Wendy Doyle. And the bios for these three impressive women are included in the materials, but just a few comments. Uh, Wendy Doyle is the CEO of United We. And I've known uh, Wendy for a long time. Wendy and We, uh, the W, no. So We is really a big, big deal. And I've watched uh, Wendy do her work across a number of organizations that she has either led or been on the board of and really champion women's issues and giving women a voice. And I especially like the part about the economic impact that women can do have on our communities. So Wendy Doyle, uh, welcome to the panel discussion. Great to see you. Next, we have uh, Luann Feehan, who is president and CEO of Nonprofit Connect. And while I haven't spent a lot of time with Luann, I can tell you that she's done a lot of great work. 
and her work is really around helping boards be as strong as they can be. And that of course includes recruiting diverse talent to the board, because when you have that diversity, again, going back to what I was describing earlier, then we have an opportunity for them to really achieve their mission, which is the ultimate goal of the connect you know, part of her work. So I've seen some of the materials, the board training, I've seen the awards that are given out because it's not enough just to help boards be better. I think the recognition that boards get and individuals get are examples of how we can continue to do the same kind of work. So Luann, welcome to the panel. Great to see you. And then next we have Nicole Jacob Silvey. She's president and CEO of Connection Coach KC, which is a company that she started. And she is working diligently to connect people in the community, address a lot of women's issues through a sisters group that she has. And also you're on the board of University Academy because education is really important. And it's an opportunity for you to participate in a way that a lot of people talk about education, but really being at the school and on the board, has gotta be a good time for you. So welcome, Nicole, to the board. I've seen people or I've heard people talk about your work uh, in the community. And while I'm, this is my first time really having a chance to be around you, it's been very impressive to see what you've done. So again, welcome. And, and thanks to all of you for the great work that you're doing. I'm gonna then move to, with the introductions, I'm gonna move to the questions that we wanted to start the discussion with and ask each panelist to address this first question that we have. And the first question is, of course, we talked about this is an important time for us to address a lot of these issues. And I wanted to start with uh, Luann, given what you do around the missions of the boards that you work for, why is this such an important time in our nation and our community to address diversity on boards and how are you going about doing it? Great, Karen, thank you so much. I am so pleased to be here and thank you to the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce for hosting this great panel. I am so proud to be among these hardworking, strong women that are fierce. Um, so in terms of board service, and I, I wanna see them specifically uh, come from the motivation of a nonprofit organization and what we're looking for. We have certainly seen some big shifts occurring in board service and even the structure of boards. Uh, there, there was a start to this shift prior to 2020. However, the activities in 2020 with COVID and social justice has really increased the intentionality behind making improvements and making changes around the board table to improve diverse thinking and get the voices of the communities that we're working with and through. So um, I, I think that has been a big part of it. The other part is board service is changing from a place where directors may have gathered to build peer camaraderie. Used to be what we call their friends, right? So board of directors would come together with their friends at a meeting and the organization was kind of there to bring them together. That is changing so rapidly that now board of directors are coming together with more intention on their efforts to assist the organization in order to influence change, positive change um, in the community and for that organization that they're serving. So they are more, um, more willing and more involved to create impact. And I, I'm very excited actually that the challenges that have occurred throughout 2020 and into 2021 continue to be addressed and um, it's not going away. I used to say prior to 2020 that things were improving, that we were getting more diversity, more women around the table. Um, but quite frankly, I think in 2020, the curtain was kind of pulled back and there was a lot of chatter about how people wanted to improve who was sitting around the board table. And now it's really been revealed that it was just chatter. We need actions. And I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm seeing actions specifically in the nonprofit sector of including more women and more diversity around the board table. 
Okay, thank you. Nicole, you talked about the accessibility to education and I put that right next to the discussion around racial equity and social justice. Can you talk a little bit about why this is important to you and your consulting firm? Sure, thank you so much, Karen. It's an honor to be here as um, Luann said amongst these amazing women and especially with your expertise. And when we say why now, um, I dare say overdue in this conversation, it's sad that there was the catalyst of 2020 to take our intention to action. So I was in the not-for-profit sector over 20 years, absolutely heard people talk about diversity on a regular basis, but in that 20 years, I hardly saw any movement. And where I see this intersectionality for, um, of race and gender equity, um, I see that as being so crucial as we take this listen, learn, lead approach. Um, when I think about education, it starts there. We talk so often about um, who we give value to, right? Who we assign value to and nothing says more about who we affirm and say their contributions have value than when we invite them to the table. And when we say the table, it starts at the dining room table, right? That education before we even get to the schools. But um, the listen, learn, lead approach that I've taken that I think is so important, it um, requires people to take a look inward first. So you're at the board table as a board member, but what are you personally doing in terms of inclusivity and creating communities of belonging. It really starts there and learning the history, the history of gender equity or um, systemic oppression and learning that history so you can say, how did we get here? And then lead is that lead from any, any chair that you're in. Um, so often we've looked in the past for those with titles because they've had the influence and it still is very much a top down type issue, but looking at those um, instances where you have privilege in any space that you're in and utilizing that to be a key to open doors for others. So when I think of my work with University Academy, I first think of the students and the families that I represent and is their voice in the room and at the table. I believe that when we bring diverse um, voices to the table in any space, that is where we have the best progress and the best innovation. So often we're making decisions on behalf of someone and, and groups of people instead of alongside them. And when we invite people to the table, that is what's so crucial and really at the key of the work that I'm doing at University Academy and some of the other boards I serve on. Sorry, turned off my mic. Uh, I was saying thank you, Nicole, because education is definitely my North Star. I mean, everything I try to do is in the spirit of providing quality education so people can reach the potential. Everybody deserves to reach their potential. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Wendy, coming to you, uh, as I mentioned, you've served on a number of boards and you've been focused a lot more recently on some of the women's issues, but you've also worked on other activities, you know, the charities, Kansas charities and so forth. So can you talk a little bit about how the work that the organizations you've been on have really highlighted some of the women's issues and, and other issues across the state that you really feel like are changing our community from a civic perspective? Absolutely. Thanks, Karen. And great to be with Luann and Nicole. Um, such a great topic that we're discussing today. So thank you to the chamber as well. Um, you know, what through our work, United We stands for United Women's Empowerment, some of the key economic issues that have really come forward to the corporate boardroom, to the nonprofit um, table, to the education table is definitely around, um, you know, um, access, you know, access, you know, most recently, um, childcare is a significant issue that's hitting the corporate boardrooms and the nonprofit sector and the, definitely the education sector as well. Um, you know, we're definitely seeing gender diversity at every level really discussed, you know, now more than ever with the selection of who's sitting around as, as we've identified here, the, the board table um, to the executive level on down through the organization. So really, you know, to underscore what Luann and Nicole have cited, you know, having those diverse points of view through the policy making, um, you know, is really, really what the trend line that we're seeing. 
Um, you know, now more than ever, it's it's a time with our COVID-19 recovery. We recognize that it's a women's economic COVID recovery challenge as women have significantly been impacted with what's happened in the last year. So, you know, I would see the trend line being that this is going to continue to be definitely part of the discussions at, you know, corporate nonprofit education level. Um, so, you know, it's a it's although we've endeared a lot over the last year, I think I think there's it's it's positive that the issues are getting put on the table. Um, so, so those are some of the trend lines, Karen, that we're we're definitely seeing. So, I was thinking about uh, back to advocacy and voices matter, and your comment also, Luann, about we haven't done enough when we pulled the cover back in, in 2020, and the ability to advocate on behalf of these issues. Your, your example, Wendy, is perfect in, in the sense that childcare and other elements of the pandemic impacted women significantly and differently. And to me, that's another reason why when we're at the table, we have to use our voices and advocate on behalf of those causes. So uh, thank you for that. I'm gonna to move to our second topic or question. And it is built off of a question because as we work our way through the community, we always hear the question of, I'm looking for talent for my board. Do you know where I can find it? Or conversely, I'd love to serve on a board. How do I get on a board? And that question comes up all the time. And then we have to try and sort through that. So the question is, how would you respond to that? Now, I'm going to start with you, Nicole. You have a training series called At the Table. So how do you help people and boards decide how to recruit, when to recruit, what type of talent to recruit, and the flip side of how, because you interact with a lot of people in the community, connect they see, but what advice do you have on that topic? You know, this is one of my favorite um, questions, Karen, and honestly, it's the catalyst for me starting my business. Um, I so often, as a woman of color in the community, people would say they're recruiting for a board and they would ask me, who do I know? And I knew when they said that they were looking, they were asking for someone who looked like me and were looking for diverse candidates. And they would say comments like, um, there's no black engineers. Um, so they were looking for a specific um, field or industry. And I would say that's an incomplete sentence you mean in your network. So what happens is we tend to seek out candidates when we need them and the relationships are not there. And what we know is that all of this begins with relationships and the who do you know can be very narrow when we use a compass of influence and affluence to determine who has value to serve on a board. So that has been the biggest catalyst is recognizing that we still largely live in segregated communities. So if we go about living our day-to-day -day lives, we often are around people who look very similar to us with similar education backgrounds, similar faith traditions and similar socioeconomic and education. So unless we intentionally build those connections and seek to learn from other communities um, in intentional and sincere ways, we will yield the same results. So what I tell people and what I help through the, um, my at the table um, practice and training is saying that we're taking attention to action because when we create a plan, things happen. When we set goals and we, what we measure we um, accomplish. And people had been talking about diversity and then doing a shrug the shoulders or head in sand and not making concrete strides because people felt uncomfortable with this conversation. When we say, who do you know? And people look around and they don't have diverse candidates that they know readily in their rich networks in terms of broad network, they realize that there's a deeper issue there. And that's what I think we've been avoiding in this country, especially until 2020. So with that, that veil, that mask pulled off, as Luann said, and that, that curtain pulled back, we, we dive in deeper to that. So what I help my clients do is first take a look at themselves and, and turn that around. There's talent development, but there's also talent acknowledgement. What I have found is that there are numerous people, professionals that I know of color, of women, whatever area of diversity, but they have not been tapped. So the talent discovery and that they have transferable skills and competencies beyond what we imagine. 
Learn, learning to serve on a board, like you mentioned, and your opportunities to build that skill set is there. But I dare say, Karen, before you even sat on that board, you had those competencies in your day-to-day -day nine to five job. And so that's what I think we need to look at. So I help um, boards to create a community of shared power and inclusive leadership so that they are a magnet to recruit and retain. We tend to think when we have a beautiful mission for an organization, and there's so many in Kansas City, that people will come based on that mission. But what I know, especially for women and then the people of color that I work with, we, we vet websites and organizations to see if it looks like a place where we would belong. So even if the mission and the content is powerful, people want to spend their volunteer time at a place where they know they're going to be valued, respected, acknowledged, and celebrated. And so creating that within the boards is what helps to do the recruitment and retention in a way that um, has really yielded results. And I've seen the Arts Council of Johnson County really dig in deep with that, as well as Junior Achievement and several of my other clients at this time. So thank you for that. I'm passionate about this topic, as you can see. Absolutely. And I think the, the tail end of your comment about belonging, and we're gonna talk some more about how you get on boards and, and the culture of boards. And that's a really important element that sense of belonging when we're looking for boards where we want to serve, volunteer our time and work in the community. So that's a really good point that you made there. Uh, I'm gonna go now to Wendy. And Wendy, you have uh, served on a number of nonprofit boards and civic boards and so forth. And what I wanted to ask you, is you've recruited a lot of people to those boards and it's sometimes difficult to balance the need to do fundraising versus the mission, people being passionate about the mission. So my question to you is, how do you recruit people to a lot of the boards that you've served on trying to balance fundraising as well as passion for the mission? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think for, for the audience, one of the things um, that they should know is that you know, for our work and, you know, in your first questions about, you know, the work we're doing in economic space, as we were spending time on these, these ish, policy issues, we really looked around and questioned where are the women. And so we really got to work and invested in a evidence-based research study with the University of Kansas, really questioning, you know, why aren't more women serving in this capacity? And the research study came back qualitative, quantitative, um, really identifying that women want to be asked to serve and um, hold back, you know, um, you know, a little bit of challenges around confidence um, when it comes to a civic appointment um, by an elected official. So what we've gone to work is launch the appointments project, which we'll be doing some additional sharing about what that means um, later this month with the chamber. But, you know, where we are going to turn to to recruit is, you know, connecting with Nicole or connecting with Luann or other um, organizations to share about, you know, women don't understand what this opportunity means, but also to encourage them to join us and to learn more that, you know, getting back to if we build confidence at that civic level by that elected official to a parks and recreation board like what you served on Karen or a planning and zoning board, that, that civic engagement, that understanding of how policy and the inner, inner workings um, happen, that that will build confidence and, and this could be our future elected leader, that we need more women advocating for these key policy issues to champion child care and other gender equity issues. Um, and have more people there. So where we really are engaging is, you know, turning to the community, trying to reach out to diverse organizations um, and really being inclusive so that we can really educate um, and tap good, good women and, and encourage them. If they want to be asked to serve, we're that resource to ask them to serve and to step up. Well, some of my seriously proudest days and efforts are around the not-for-profit work and the civic work that uh, I've been able to participate in because it really does force us to think about the future of our community and what we want, what it needs. And I love the fact that women like to be asked and, and 
because the, the truth is, it's rare when people are asked to do something in our great Kansas City. We're one of the most philanthropic communities in the nation. I think we're in the top five on a per capita basis. People will volunteer. We have to put together ways to bring that resource pool, if you will, together and make sure people really get a chance to participate in this important work. So thank you for the work you're doing, Wendy. Aaron, can I add to that a moment? Yes. And that is that I think that women do need to be asked. So I love that you bring up that point. I think that they need to be asked and they're not accustomed. We're not accustomed to just speaking up because we're so busy and we're juggling so many different things that to be asked means that we are embraced and that we wanna be a part of the conversation. And women are also, even though we don't say no very often, we, when it comes to board service, we do give it great consideration. Can we squeeze this into our day? Mm -hmm. And the impact of serving on this board matters so much that I will find the time, which is different maybe than other genders. Mm -hmm. Women really give this a, a stronger analysis of being um, honored to being asked and then giving it serious consideration mm -hmm. they can really commit to the, the service. And Luann, I would just build on that, you know, what we've also heard is that women feel they're underqualified. And these could be women with masters and PhDs and still feeling I'm not quite experienced to meet all the criteria that you're looking for. And even when being considered or thinking about a corporate board, still kind of undervaluing their expertise, their experiences when they're completely overqualified and ready to go. So again, I think, you know, as women, we have a responsibility responsibility to also, you know, reach out, encourage, lift up, support, um, you know, knowing that women want to be asked, we, we have that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And Karen, then I'm just adding on as well, because I'm just ping ponging off some of these great comments. I do believe that women want to be asked. And then there's this fine line, if we do the intersectionality again of race and gender, where um, women of color may be asked and feel as if they're being asked to check a box. So knowing that the ask is an intentional and sincere one that goes beyond just um, diversity representation, but that, that it's inclusive and that their um, attributes that they're bringing to the table once they're there are going to be validated and affirmed and celebrated. So I agree with everything the ladies have said, great points. That is true about the maybe checking the box, but I wanna go back to what Wendy said, we often are overqualified. <laughs> And, and so it's an oddity that you feel like you're being asked to check the box, but, and, and that's not true in every case. I'm just saying that when that happens, you know, it makes it more difficult to belong, makes it more difficult to participate. And really the organization misses an opportunity because so often that happens and you know, we can look in our corporate worlds or whatever. And while it's a lot better than it used to be, some of that does carry over. So we're needed in board involvement and in leadership, not mm -hmm. boards are more apt to be uh, productive with women on it. With more women, members are more involved. And I'm not just talking the women, they intend, they, they have a tendency to embrace the culture. I know we're gonna to get to that with the, mm -hmm. the group and mm -hmm. engage more of the other board of directors and they engage more in fundraising. When they participate, they participate mm -hmm. and involved in public policy and advocacy and mm -hmm. share with their networks and the relationships to build public awareness, which nonprofits need so greatly. Women are far more plugged in to making things happen maybe than um, other genders are. Well, Luann, let's keep going with that. And given what you do in terms of board training and making boards stronger and so forth, maybe you can share some of the best practices that you've seen where boards are being very intentional about bringing diversity in skill, gender, race, all of that. Because I think that's an important lens to think about it through. What are the best practices for boards well, to consider when they're trying to bring to bear what we're talking about? That it's a great question. And this goes back to kind of the um, improvement of board development. 
again, we're getting away from that friend trap of having friends around the table that come with their own agendas. Now with intention, not only are we talking more about the voices that are represented around the table to ensure that there's diversity, but even going a step further, it's more than just asking someone to serve on the board. It's also what voice do they represent? What talent and skill do they have? How can they help the organization stabilize or scale up and serve their mission to their greatest potential? So, you know, putting together a metric or, or identifying where the gaps are and then going out intentionally and creating the relationships if they don't already have them or taking a look at who is already naturally attracted to an organization, whether they're already volunteering or they're already on social media or they're already of a client. And I was working with one organization that was struggling with bringing on more diversity onto their board. And we got talking about the neighborhood that they're in, right? Of just going out and talking to their neighbors that are in the community and inviting them to be around the table and then set the standard of moving forward. If they have a capacity on their board of size, it's about expanding that capacity and opening it up, not just bringing on one more board of director or two more board of directors, be intentional to really bring on a group of individuals that can change the conversation around the table and get everybody thinking and uncomfortable, but moving the organization forward. Um, so, you know, many organizations will bring on one or two directors a year to kind of have an even flow. And sometimes organizations have a hard time of getting rid of those that have been on there for decades. But this is about the transition of bringing on more individuals, more diverse voices, and really um, paying attention and listening to what they can contribute. So it's really, it's really being more thoughtful in how we attack the growth of the organization by listening and building relationships within our community and putting in the work to do so. But on the friend topic, just a little storytelling here, one of my boards that I serve on, and it is a publicly traded board, and so independence, of course, matters, but we have a rule. You cannot put someone on the list to be considered for a board position if you are friends with them, if you know them socially. I mean, it's, it's a pretty strict, hard line, but it forces the intentionality of, okay, we need to get beyond our sphere of influence. And we actually have a matrix that's now been adopted by three of the boards that I'm on, a matrix of what the company needs, the skills they need, and then the other factors that really matter, diversity of the social issues that we're talking about. So it's, I do think it's changing. Now, friends are sometimes easier to help you fundraise and certain uh, organizations and not-for-profits and things like that. But I do think sitting down, figuring out what you need and being committed to go find it will bring about a little more balance. Any other comments on that topic? Karen, I'll just add on. Uh, Luvian. Oh. Yes. Luann said so many great things and um, I echo everything that she was sharing. And some of it is um, in addition to the intentionality that matrix that you talked about, but I think it's even um, making sure when you have onboarding that there's some type of buddy system. Some people call it board mentors, but that when someone joins the board that they have another person, another ally, especially if they don't have a friend, another ally on the board that they can ask questions of, that they can learn about the board culture and that there's intentional relationship building even outside of the um, board meeting. So there's some social time, if it's coffee or check-in between meetings, I think that is crucial. And things that we often do with friends that we overlook when someone is new. Um, you talk about storytelling. I remember being a young woman in my career, early thirties and being asked to serve on a board and being elated because I loved the mission and loved everything about the organization. And while I was invited and recruited, with a lot of um, enthusiasm. Once I got into the room, those weren't my peers. And so beyond saying hello, people really didn't speak to me. I ended up engaging with the staff. So I didn't feel a sense of belonging even though I was committed to the mission. And so if I had that buddy that had been there, what a difference that would have made. I also think about, 
this is one of those times where top down really matters. And I think as a board chair, modeling inclusivity and soliciting feedback. We know that there's certain people who are those, those outgoing voices that are in a room and may dominate, but taking the time to ask people and solicit their input, especially in their areas of expertise based on the matrix and other things that they wanna contribute is mm -hmm. so crucial. Um, and I think just soliciting input is, is key, but also those check-ins, like I mentioned, and making sure that that culture of belonging persists even in your absence. So what happens is we know boards rotate in and out, board members, as we have our board terms, and leadership can change, but that that culture persists even when the leadership changes. I think that's so key as well as a best practice. Well, Karen, Karen, I would just add, I love those points, Nicole. Great, great point and love the buddy system. I would just add definitely in this, in this, you know, government boards and commissions work that we're doing um, that, you know, it's, it's really needs to catch up with the with the 21st century. I mean, we're really behind and have a lot of work to do. You know, something just as basic as, you know, just do you do you know your gender composition of your boards and commissions at the city, county, state level, which you seems like an easy question to answer, but it's extremely difficult. But, you know, one of the things that we're really working on is not just having one woman on placed on an all male board or a commission that we really want to be effective to have two women to support one another. So, you know, I think you can apply that that, you know, concept. Um, you know, to nonprofit board education, corporate board, but it's not just, you know, it's a, not just a woman, but, you know, it could be a young person, not just having one young person on the board, but two, so their voices, they could support one another and really be heard. So I think we need to be intentional with that practice as well. Yes, well said. Back to the, the buddy system. When I joined Teladoc Health's board, it was the result of a merger. And that was the first call I got was from the person who was assigned my buddy as my buddy. And uh, we meet before every meeting and it, it really has been very helpful. So good points, uh, Nicole and, and Wendy. So let's move into kind of more of a conversation. And I say that in the context, of, you know, you guys chime in wherever you'd like to uh, make a point and I'll be on the lookout for when you want to uh, participate. We, we already have you know, one question. It actually came right at the very top of our discussion. And the question is, how do I transition from a not-for-profit board to a corporate board? And then that takes me to uh, the first topic that we wanted to touch on in this piece of the panel. And that is what resources are available to help companies to help civic organizations, not-for-profits, and people who want to serve on boards because they want to get back or they want additional experience and so forth. So we always talk about, well, there are uh, groups around Kansas City, like the Women's Corporate Directors Group. There are other activities, training. Um, there are recruiters out there who are looking for uh, various types of diversity. There are all, all kinds of things that are out there. Networking is probably the number one thing that people mention. If you want to be on a board, how to network, or if you want to uh, look for people to be on your board. So I'll open it up to the kinds of resources that are out there that can help people uh, get on a board or help a board recruit folks. And for me, as I mentioned, in my opening comments, it was at work as well. Uh, Black and Beach wanted to develop us to our fullest potential by getting external perspective because we're often at work doing all kinds of things that are internally focused. But I'll open it up to what resources are available to people to make those choices, boards and potential board members. Go ahead, Wendy. So we definitely, um, through our appointments project work, 
we um, serve as a resource for the elected official. Um, they know we have the appointments project. So when there are openings available and we have a relationship with an elected official, they'll reach out to us and say, I'm looking for someone, a woman um, that lives in this district with that may be an attorney or a specific professional profession that they're looking for. Um, so we are that we hear of those opportunities and then the appointments project um, we have an applicant pool. So women who are interested in serving in this way, women can apply um, to the appointments project and express their interest in what they may be looking for. And then when we hear of those opportunities or those opportunities become available, we'll, we'll inform that applicant pool of this opportunity is available if you are interested. Um, so that is a resource that we provide because sometimes those opportunities just are are not as you know highlighted as they should be. Um, so we serve as that resource. Okay. And I think from the the question it's done, it also like how do you get on a corporate board? And I think it is uh, probably one of the harder aspects to get on a corporate board. More so, um, definitely, I would think of the three that we've talked about with corporate, civic, and nonprofits. I, I think. Corporate boards are a little bit more um, male dominated and harder to get on. And it's great that we have United We in the community that can really serve its purpose in helping women get into uh, the civic highlight and making the decisions in the community. For nonprofits, I think of the three will are probably the easiest because there's so many nonprofits that are looking for directors. It's a great entry point to learn governance and fiduciary responsibility and just understand the roles and responsibility of what it means to be a good director. And that is great um, education then to be a better leader on a civic board and on corporate boards. But I agree with whoever asked that question. I think it's more challenging to get on a corporate board. I agree. And I would just add, um, Karen, um, not about getting on a corporate board, but when you were talking about the broader question of how do you, um, you recruit or how do um, members um, or individuals find opportunities from board membership, I think a space that's really been missed are the affinity groups and the ERGs, the employee resource groups that are a part of many of the corporations around Kansas City. There's usually one that is um, gender based that I think can be a perfect opportunity for not-for-profit boards and corporate boards to recruit additional board members. Um, I'm gonna be working with um, Uncover KC on this very topic on how to it, cultivate those relationships with the ERGs and um, not-for-profit organizations. And I think that is really at the heart of so much of this. Um, also, of course, um, Support Kansas City, I've been working with them and they've been doing, they're a great resource and there's more to come. We've been doing a board diversity initiative um, for not-for-profit organizations. So it's a two-fold approach. It's answering this very question that Karen's talking about. We're working to help um, cultivate this culture of inclusivity and belonging within boards. So boards of directors would go through a training series and get additional support and coaching. At the same time, there's a pipeline of candidates who are looking for board service that are cultivating those skills and then there is um, an opportunity to connect. So there's more to come on that, but there is this pilot program that's um, starting that's gonna be really robust in this area. Um, I think the topic of connecting the two is one that's gonna be ongoing for months to come. So thank you. Thanks, Nicole. I, I wanna add to this discussion. I talked about my uh, corporate board experience when I was at, at Black and & Beach and I was on the Black and Beach board, but of course, as an executive director, uh, not independent, but still a great experience. And what I wanna say to those on this call, if your goal is to make the transition from nonprofit to corporate board, because Luann's right, it is more difficult to make that transition. I, I do think the first uh, item that boards look at, do you have any board experience? So all of this board experience is relevant. So I think that's number one, even though we get on not-for-profit not boards to give back and serve the community on civic boards, I think getting board experience is important, however you go about getting that. 
But I also think there is a shared responsibility between the company, the corporate leaders and their board to make sure women who work in their company get the opportunity for these corporate board experiences. And I would say the same about men, we're talking about women today, but I think it is so important and it's especially important for women because back to an earlier comment about women like to be asked, it should be part of your uh, personal development plan to be involved in a corporate board and your company should recognize and embrace it's also their responsibility to give you the time, the connection, and the resources to get on a corporate board. And that, to me, it makes your company stronger because you have a person who has additional perspective, a learning opportunity, and it also says, we are willing to invest in you because you're going to bring that back home to the company that you work for. So I, I just, I think it's a shared responsibility to help people get on corporate boards. It's vitally important to having a balanced professional career as well. And it you know, also takes me to the recruiting aspect of this because of the ongoing, I'll just say pressure on corporate boards to bring about greater diversity to everybody's point, they may not have the network. They may not even know where groups of talent are. So they are hiring recruiters from very capable, recognizable firms. And it would be in everybody's best interest to find out who those companies are and maybe have your own conversation if it's outside of work or whatever, because the recruiters are working 24 seven trying to find talent to serve on the board. So that's, that's another way to connect. But if you are in the workforce, I'm, I'm retired now, but I think that was a game changer in my career in that I had a chance to go and see other things and the company invested. But I think more companies would gain a tremendous benefit from doing that. And you see more and more of it, but it's I think it's on the rise and it is a shared responsibility. I'll stop because that's my hot button. <laughs> but but um, so then let's talk a little bit about the fact that uh, all of these activities are important then you get on a board and you start trying to belong or develop this um, culture, be part of the culture and all the rest of that. So as we think about, okay, let's say we've moved past some of what we just described, we're on the board and now you know, we're in a position where we have to participate and sometimes it's uncomfortable. What are some of the things that I think boards could do to create that sense of belonging. We talked about the buddy system. We've talked about uh, being intentional about who you bring to the board. But the reality is in some of these situations, it can be intimidating either because you're a new person or because there's somebody who talks a lot or too much or talks down or whatever. But it's how do we address that? In a lot of places, best practices, I think, are the chairs of the board make sure everybody participates. And at some point, even go around the room if you don't get enough participation. So what are some of the cultural issues we face getting on the board and how do we address them? I see Wendy's leaning forward a little bit there. If you want to go, Wendy? Okay. I jumped in last time. Luann, do you want to jump in first? <laughs> I know you've got great experience on this. I'm happy to, or I'll dovetail on where, wherever you lead. I'll say this because I think the question that I saw in the chat is how do you understand the culture of a board and if you fit before you actually join? Mm -hmm. and for that, I think that is the key is before you join a board to do some due diligence, not always what you see from the outside is the reality of what is happening on the inside of any board service. I think so. Um, asking questions with not just one, but two, three, or more of the current directors that are already on there and asking them, what has their experience been like? And what is the culture? And 
how does the board get along with the staff or with the CEO or the executive? Because many times that's what is bringing down the culture is when there is conflict either among board of directors or with uh, board of directors and the, the executive. So learning that dynamic before you get in there is really important. The other person I would ask would be the executive and ask what is their relationship with the board or what do you need to be aware of before you get on the board? Mm -hmm. There's such a sinking feeling if you say yes and you get accepted to the board and you go to your first meeting and you sit down and you find out that the culture is not accepting or is toxic um, or you sit down and you find out that the financials are not what you thought they were going to be and now you're really into a whole effort that is a surprise to you. That's not a good way to enter into it. Unless you know it in advance, if you are a fixer and if you feel like the problems that are occurring with the organization fit your skill set and you are determined to make a difference and create an impact and that your voice will make a difference, then that is perfect for you. But knowing before you get in is the key. Once you're in as a director and you find out that the culture is maybe not what you expected, then it is being a part of the positive change, not just sitting there adding to the, the, the discouraging aspect of it, but creating positive change and being a voice around the table that shifts the current dynamic. Because oftentimes we find that there is usually one director that may be pulling down the whole group, but no one wants to address it or take it on. Um, so if you don't take it on, it's not going to change, right? So be a part of that a culture. But when, when the culture of a board is in harmony and working great and in a rhythm, that's when the organization, that's when the civic service, that's when the corporation really rises and at an accelerated rate is when there is complete harmony. Well, that, that was very well said. And we are approaching the top of the hour where our guests are going to submit questions. I, I wanna honor that. But before we go there, uh, Wendy, Nicole, Luann, any parting advice or takeaway that you want to make sure we cover before we get into the question and answer session? I see Wendy. I would just build on, you know, just a couple of things to add on to what Luann um, was talking about for the culture piece. You know, in this, in the more public setting, you know, there is transparency and you can learn more about the culture of a board or a commission through public minutes. They encourage you to um, attend a meeting before actually committing. Um, so you really have an understanding. But I, I would just say in, in more of a parting word that as women, we have a responsibility to use our voice, whether it be at the at the nonprofit, the corporate, um, or an education board. We have a responsibility, and especially on a on a government appointment, um, you're you're representing yourself, but you're representing a larger community, and you have you must take it seriously and you must use your voice. And as women, I think we can do better about using our voice and feeling confident and speaking up about the things that are important to us. Okay. Oh. Oh, thanks, Karen. Um, I similarly, I had very similar sentiment to what Wendy was saying. And I believe um, allyship is crucial. And in this advocacy, I can remark on how many times I had something inappropriate said in a meeting and someone would say something to me in the parking lot about how awful that was or, or something that wasn't okay, but didn't say something in the meeting. And even it may have been me who didn't feel confident to say something in the time. If we don't um, take the opportunity to speak up and use our voices, things are gonna persist. So that old adage of what's gotten us here won't get us there, I think is the season that we're in. We were Kansas City nice or socialized to not say anything or, or be concerned. And honestly, risk for the most part is why people have stayed quiet. But um, identifying those allies around the board table and amplifying those voices and linking arms so that we can create change. I would like to add, you know, the United We, formerly the Women's Foundation, um, has 
brought in some really wonderful speakers. And Madeline Albright was one of my favorite that the foundation brought in. And she shares a story that I think is relevant to this. And that story is, is that when she became Secretary of State and traveling internationally, she didn't really know what to say, right? So you go to that first meeting and you listen to what people have to say and you just take it all in and kind of get a lay of the land. And she didn't say anything. And she went to her second international meeting and listened and soaked it all in. And it wasn't until her third meeting that she realized for her to be there and to not say anything was as, as if the United States had no voice and was never represented or even there. Board service is the same way. So women, get on a board, sit around the table and speak your voice. If you say nothing at a board meeting, it's as if you were never there. So we have great talent, we have great opinions, we have great intuition that this is the time to really use it and speak up and make a difference. Uh, those are great comments and I remember the Madeleine Albright <laughs> uh, speech when she was at uh, the foundation luncheon. I I'll just close by saying, Wendy, you brought up, we represent ourselves, but we also represent our communities. And you know, we operate with integrity and interest in solving problems. And this whole discussion about culture, uh, one of my favorite quotes from uh, Dr. Maya Angelou is you must have courage to live your convictions every day, or in this case, every board meeting. When you feel like you need to say something or something isn't going the way it should, or at least you think it should, integrity and speaking up create courage and conviction. So I, I think it's, we're gonna get more and more opportunities. And if we do what the four of us just said <laughs> in our closing comments, I think we'll get greater opportunities and have greater impact. So we will transition now. Thank you so much uh, for all your comments. It's been great. And uh, we'll transition to the questions. And I'm gonna read the questions off and whoever wants to respond first, you may. So what, what is one obstacle preventing women from getting board positions? I could answer all of these just because we're all passionate, but I'm not gonna do that. Just because I'm reading them don't mean doesn't mean that uh, you guys shouldn't chime in. So what's the one thing, we could each say that. What's one thing that keeps women from getting on boards? I'm gonna say what Wendy said earlier, the perception that we're underqualified. <laughs> but others? I would say, you know, back to the original point of that women are wanting to be asked, you know, so, you know, that's holding women back from getting on board. So women need to, you know, be a little bit more confident and express their interest, um, you know, and, and put it out there and see where that will lead. And I would just add on, Karen, I think it's access and opportunity, especially when we look at that intersectionality of gender and race. Um, many of the women of color I know don't know the decision makers or those influencers in their network to be noticed or recognized for their talents and then asked as Wendy said. I would say women need to do a better job of letting people know that they're interested in board service and um, allow people to help bring them along or get us involved. I think there are a lot of, like, I know nonprofits out there which are really getting a, a lot better about having women around the table. And in part because 75% of organizations in Kansas City are led by women. So we want to have more of our voices around the table. So let the organization know that you have interest and um, give it time for the cycle to happen in order to get, get, get your service started. This next question uh, relates to some of the comments that Steve made at the very top of our discussion today. And he was talking about the progress that has been made with women on boards and we still only have one in five. I'll add to his comments that, for example, in the state of California, they have legislated that at least 12% of your board has to be women. This is for publicly traded companies. But the question that came from our participants relates to what 
metrics, what accountability metrics should we use around diversity, equity, and inclusion on boards? I'll start here. We really use the metric of the, the reflection of the population. So representation of what our population looks like should be, you know, what our, our boards and commissions look like at the city, county, and state level. That's a good one. And, and I'll add to that one. Often, depending on the kind of company we're talking about, your board should reflect your clients as well. And that's one of the metrics that I think is important for corporations and communities because frankly, the community is our client. But so it's the same outcome, but I think you have to think about who you're doing business with and which, whose lives you're trying to affect. Nicole or Lynn, either one? I was just gonna say the same thing that both you and Wendy did, I agree those metrics just reflecting the community and the client serve that's spot on. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I'll go to the next question. Is there a formal or informal group that supports women already on for-profit for, uh, for and corporate boards? I will take a swing at that one. We, we do have the Women's Corporate Directors Group uh, here in Kansas City. And if you are on two boards and there is an annual membership fee, but it is a great resource for learning what's going on as best practices around boards, whether it's governance or financial issues, recruiting, whatever it might be. And uh, it is also a great place to network. We often invite males to the meeting so that you know, you have a chance to talk to a broader group of people who are interested in board uh, directorship. So I would put that one out there uh, first. Others? Okay. Well, we talked a, a little bit about uh, metrics, I'll call them the accountability metrics that I just mentioned. And again, Steve talked about some of the progress, but we know there's more work to do. And we've talked about being intentional and so forth. But as we sit here today, you know, if we could wave the magic wand, what would we say to the three groups of boards that we've talked about, not-for-profits, civic, and corporate boards? to really move the needle significantly. I'll start, Karen. To wave the magic wand with our work, I had mentioned, you know, it's really data collection. And I'm, you know, we're really starting at an elementary level of just trying to get arms around information, um, you know, at these city, county, state boards. Um, you know, part of the part of the issue is transition and administration. So just when you get the system down, then there could be a new elected official as the leader. So you're starting over again. But but we really need to get a baseline to really understand, you know, where we're starting from to where we need to go. So if I could wave the magic wand, it would be in data collection. Okay. All right. Anybody else? If I could wave the magic wand, Karen, I think it would be um, to just present more opportunities, but also for boards to look beyond just title and look at talent. That's the best way I can say it. So often I've seen boards and they want to recruit again influence and affluence. And we know that women and specifically women of color have barriers in those areas or specific boards that are looking for C-suite level. And then that narrows the pool even, even lower. Um, when women have had barriers to access to those positions and titles, then they're also going to have barriers to board service. Um, the competencies that are needed to serve on those boards can be in someone who isn't a C-suite level. So I want the, the net to be cast wider for the um, idea of who has, again, value and influence and a space at the table to be broadened out instead of this narrow avatar that we've used for decades. Um, that's persistent and for men too as well, but specifically for women, I think we need to broaden that out so that we are looking at um, people that are more reflective of our community 
instead of just this really narrow window. That's that's the thing that I would most want to see. Okay. I have one one more. Oh, go ahead, Luann. I would just say for me, it's kind of a big question and kind of a radical response, actually. And if I had a magic wand, I would start all over again and you know, work on the systemic problems that we have. I think where we're at today is a more solid growth mode. The challenge is that we've got old thinking and old school traditions in the way. So my magic wand would be start fresh where we're at today and what is important to today, where we need to be in the future. And I think things would dramatically change quickly. Well, I, I wanted to share just a quick story that I think covers what all of you have said. I was on a conference call with uh, Melody Hobson, and she was looking for a new general counsel for her company. The general counsel was retiring. He offered to find his replacement, and some months went by and he couldn't find anything. And Melody was very clear that she wanted a woman of color in that role. And um, I'm bringing this up because the last question we just received was about women of color. And the short version is he tried for months and he never found anyone. He retired and Melody took over the search. And her point was, we have to look for talent in different ways than we traditionally have. Because we went to the same places that we always go to we go to, if you're looking for a general counsel for this kind of company, then you go look at all those companies or whatever. Melody took over the search and she found the deputy general counsel of the Chicago uh, Board of Trade two blocks from her office, two blocks. And so you have to look for talent where talent lives as opposed to our traditional ways of doing things. So it was a great story that if you are intentional and that's what you want to do, you'll find ways to get it done. So it was a, it was a great story. Two blocks away from their office in downtown. Karen, Karen, I would just build on that point. I love that. And one of the things we've actually um, been a part of a research piece that University of Kansas has done and really looking at the superintendents and, you know, most of superintendents in, in schools are white men. And when they're testing the theory of when you change the search committee composition, do you get a different outcome? So to build on the point, once Melody stepped in, you know, that, that search committee um, composition looked different and had some different thinking. So I think that's, you know, another takeaway, whether it be for corporate or, you know, civic, board or corporate, whatever it may be, you know, thinking about what that task force, that search committee looks like to have some different thinking around the table. So I love that. And Melody Hobson is going to be our keynote speaker this year. So she's come, she's, um, so she's going to be speaking on September 29th. Selfish plug, sorry, but I had to mention that, Karen. <laughs> no, that, that's a great plug, Wendy. Well, uh, we have unfortunately come to the point in our panel discussion here that we have to stop, but I want to first thank the participants for joining us today. Great questions, uh, both that you turned in and that appear in the chat. A very, very special thank you to this incredible group of panelists. Uh, the conversation has been rich, actionable, and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys somewhere in Kansas City soon. It really, it's been a great conversation. And again, back to where we started, thanks to the chamber for having the event. KPMG and Midwest Bank Midwest for supporting us, but it's been a great conversation and I'm going to turn it back to Christine. Thank you so much, Karen. This has been fantastic. I know I'm um, pleased to just um, hear the, the inspiring conversation today. Thank you to everyone who's attended the virtual event. Um, again, we wanna reiterate and thank Bank Midwest and KPMG for their support of women's leadership programming here at the chamber. Um, without them, it would not be possible. And um, at a time when it went, advancing women in leadership is more important now than ever. Um, along the lines, we wanna remind you that the nominations for Athena and Young Athena Leadership Awards are now 
now open until June 30th. Um, you can nominate um, a, a award recipient on our website at kcchamber.com. Karen is a great example of what it takes to be an Athena award recipient. Um, we will select the recipients in August and then celebrate them in October. And we hope to do that um, in person this year. Last but not least, the conversation here has just begun. So join us in about two weeks for a virtual information session about United We's appointment project. I know that that's something that Wendy had mentioned throughout this conversation. It's going to be um, virtual on June 23rd at noon. Registration link has been pasted in the chat and you will learn more about the program um, as well as learn um, from three women who have been appointed through the appointments project. Nikki Lee Donova, Jennifer Ingraham, and Carolyn Wally. Again, thank you everyone who participated and attended today's event and have a great rest of your afternoon.